Hi, and welcome to the 10th episode of the Feeder segment of the Chicken Chess Club podcast. And um, today is the 29th of February, leap day in, in a leap year. But speaking of giant leaps, one of our Chicken Chess Club members had a really career-defining moment today, as far as I heard, right? <laughs> That's where that's how we're gonna start. The no, I mean, real let, breaking me, news. let me just say it honestly. My first feeling was en- envy and anger. How did you react to it? It was definitely the big news of the chess week. I'm not sure if this has been made public yet. So we it could definitely, definitely hasn't been made public. We have just seen uh, he basically bragged by showing a a segment of an email uh, on a sort of private chat. But uh, I it, it annoys me. So I'm just gonna say it out loud. Laurent Fresnay has been offered a job on an appeals uh, committee. I mean, this basically our podcast makes sense. But I, uh, to be honest, I hoped it wouldn't be here. I, I'm happy for him. I am. I'm a little bit sad because I think it does. You know, as soon as he stopped the podcast, the the offer starts rolling in for the appeals committee. So it does mean he's probably never coming back at this point. It's, his his decision has been fully justified, and uh, yeah, he's on his way to a. Uh, life of luxury as a hopefully a regular appeals committee member and i guess we should explain uh, if someone hasn't listened to the like <laughs> 70 earlier podcasts but basically the point of being in an appeal committee is that uh, you get a free trip you know you get a nice hotel meals vip treatment and normally you don't have to do anything actually there will be no cases nothing to do right i mean at least that's how we try to to describe it yeah, and I, I suspect, knowing how Laurent's luck usually plays out, that there will be no no incidents whatsoever, and he'll just have a nice, cushy week. So, I, good for him. I'm happy for him. Okay. Well, well all opinions differ there, but uh, fair enough. Anyway, moving on to perhaps uh, more relevant subjects. But let's start with a quiz. Who is uh, Indian number one right now? So, at time of recording, which is 6 13 Central European time on the 29th of February. It is Arjun Aragaisi. We'll see if that changes during this recording, but at the moment it's Arjun. It's really it's Arjun. kind of caught up because he wasn't really in the running at some point. He was a little bit behind the others, and yeah, he's overtaken everyone. So, okay, all right. I mean, but in the weekend it was Vichy, right? At some point it was. It was, also... it was Vichy, and then it was Prague. Uh, I think a couple of weeks ago it was Gokesh at some point. And I think Vidit also got there as well. Vidit was there at some point. So basically, yeah, it's been like five different people in a few weeks. And Vichy was number one for how long time before? Longer than I've been alive, I think. I'm I'm reasonably sure. (laughs) No, but also, it's going to sound insulting, but we're talking plus 30 years here, right? I mean... Yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, sure. So I mean, but let's let's see. I mean, what what could change? Uh, there's a tournament happening in Prague right now, right? Yeah, there's Prague is in Prague. Okay, Gukesh as well, and the guys see too, I guess, right? Uh, no, uh, Vidit and Gukesh and Prague are all in Prague, and Erigaisi is in. I want to say Shanghai, but I think it might not be Shanghai. It's some, okay, somewhere in China. There's okay. another super tournament with Dubov, Artemiev, Giri, Yu Yang Yi. A couple of others. It's, it's uh, so that is too complicated actually to, to sort of keep keep track of. But uh, should things happen within the next ten minutes, we will we'll update you there. Yeah, and um, on the the official list just came out uh, a day early before the first of March, and on the official list, Vichy is still number one. Okay, but uh, well, we are sort of uh, more up to the beat here, so we keep you sort of there. Speaking of the first uh, of March, the first of March rating list. Big new things is going to happen, right? It's the FIDE giveaway. Tell us ab- about what's... I mean, a lot of people is going to suddenly see a bunch of rating points rolling in, right? Yeah, so FIDE have changed the rating system and they've given bonus points to every player under 2,000? I think so, yeah. So it's it's definitely some kind of bribe. I'm not sure what the purpose of the bribe is, but I, I'm regarding it as a bribe at the moment. So every player under 2,000, starting at th- everyone at 1,000 gets bumped up to 1,400. So there'll be no one under 1,400 anymore. And then you get less, like you get fewer points the closer you get to 2,000. So 
I think it's 1600, you get like 200 points. And I think so, yeah. Somewhere. 1800, you get 100. And then if you're like uh, 1996, you probably get one point or something like that. Right? Yeah. And if you're 2001, you get nothing. You get nothing, right. But there's no, I mean, you can never be overtaken by someone behind you after all. That that much, uh, I think my, my math is good enough to, to say. But yes, um, that's true. What, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to avoid uh, some kind of Indian kit suddenly jumping to number one on the rating list? Or... I, yeah, I mean, I think they've noticed some problems with deflation in the rating system. I think I think the problems are definitely real. I think the rating system, when it was designed, hasn't really taken into consideration the rate that people improve online. Mm-hmm. So there's, uh, for example, I saw a player last week who was rated 1,200 FIDE and 2,000 on chess.com. And he, this wasn't a junior, this was an adult player. He was mid 20s or so. And I've also recently play, uh, talked to a couple of unrated players who are kind of 1800, 1900 on chess.com. And this is their first, first year playing over the board chess. So there's definitely some oddities with the rating system at the moment. But I'm kind of curious how it's going to play out because. Surely by the end of the year, a lot of these points will filter their way up the ladder to to higher rated players. And I'm not sure if this is going to cause a lot of inflation at the top or if it's just... If the very top are too far away from under 2,000 players that make any difference, I, I'm, I'm really... I'm generally don't. curious. I have zero clue, right? I mean, they will make the argument in poker that money travels all the way up to the top players. But I have no idea if it works like that with rating points. Also, I mean... Well, it's not like like money that is one to one. I mean, well, there is something with expected scores and such. So I don't know how it will see, but I mean, you don't expect uh, Magnus or anyone else to break twenty nine hundred uh, due due to this uh, at the end of the year, right? We don't expect to see anything massive at the top. Is my impression. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure. I mean, yeah, it will be interesting to see how it plays out. But I mean, a lot of people have been given, you know, up to four hundred rating points, so. Overall, the system must have taken in millions of rating points. And um, how, how is the, let's say, the well, the chess.com ratings? I mean, generally, for a server who wants to have more and more players uh, playing, it would make sense to have some kind of inflation so that everybody feels they're getting better and better. But, uh, well, I'm wondering if it's a bit of the same here. That, well, let's give some people some rating points. They'll be happy. Or you think that was actually some very serious problems to solve? Yeah, I'm really not sure. I mean, definitely there was some problems, but my my experience is that I've played against some 1500s that I felt were just 1500s. Like the the games were just what I would expect. When I played 1500s, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I think it's pretty much the same. But I've definitely come across other 1500s that were definitely not that level. Uh, whether they played online or studied a lot or something but they, it did seem like the rate for some people not i don't think it's everyone for sure and i guess there's you know we talk a lot about uh, indian players and we've definitely seen you know 17 1800 indian players who are very competitive with ims and gms and that definitely suggests that that can be part of the problem but i think you know there's not a huge amount of feeder rated chess in India. So that's no, but that's hard. more a regional problem, right? That yeah. Start, start to lowly rate it, and there is too few options to, you know, jump forward. So when they finally get a chance to play somewhere else, their ratings are, are, are just too low. But uh, I mean, well, also, it's rarely that I uh, admit uh, incompetence, but I honestly have no sort of particular skills to, to say anything useful about this. Uh, I don't know about you. No, I'm, I mean, my plan is to hopefully take advantage of it, grab some brain points about it this year. But yeah, that could backfire, um, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Moving on to something that's unrated. Uh, I think the last time we we spoke, it was in the early days of the Chess 96 event in, the, in Germany, right? Yeah, I think we talked just before the event started. You were already... Oh, before the event started, Germany. yeah. Yeah. I was, before the event was starting, and I was most likely bragging about golf uh but that that went worse and um, so did the chess 960 actually magnus started out with having three pretty 
bad days and was about to be eliminated in, in the quarterfinals against uh, Ali Reza uh, and such. But uh, and that I mean the whole concept of the tournament I think was to popularize Chess 960 to show that uh, you know this is very interesting to 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 play and to watch. They also for the first time played at top level with the classical time control. So there was a lot of experiment happened, and I think Magnus really wanted it to go well, not necessarily for himself, but the problem was, had Magnus lost in the quarterfinals, I guess PR would have been considerably worse, right? I mean, if you have sort of semifinals and finals and Magnus plays for, for the lowest places, uh, that wouldn't be too good, right? Yeah, and it was also called the greatest of all time challenge, which yeah. could have... <laughs> Could have backfired quite. Could could have, could have backfired a bit. So that uh, strangely, I mean, this uh, this quarterfinal against Ali Reza felt uh, pretty. I mean, I was nervous before game two. Sort of more like, okay, damn it, is this sort of experiment actually gonna go go wrong like like that? Uh, but it didn't. Magnus managed to come back, and uh, the last five days he played uh, incredibly well actually, and, and won this thing. I don't know. What would you like to know from? Uh, I mean. From 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 the V spot that I that I hang out with Trent who talks about uh, cryptocurrencies or that I will play table football with a world champion or I mean that uh, the spa environment is fine and there was nothing to work on because it was just nine sixty. What well you know what's interesting? I guess about? I guess my first question is this was a basically a brand new event from a new a new sponsor at least I'm not sure who was doing the actual organizing but there was definitely a lot of new things mm -hmm. around the event so maybe we should talk a little bit about the sponsor because this is someone who hasn't really done any chess tournaments before as far as i know he doesn't have any major ties to russia but if you no, investigated I, more closely yeah I, I i did and i didn't find much maybe i just you know well mainly it's so easy with feeder you just uh you know put the feeder sponsor name and you put put in and normally there is a match, right? And and that didn't come out uh, on, on this guy, uh, at least. But, um, no, I think his story is... I think he got rich on some IT company. I think I can remember the name, but it will be embarrassing if I get it wrong, so so better not. And he had some kind of interest uh, in chess. I think he was doing personal lessons with uh, Huschenberg, uh, and um, he was also the commentator there. I... I Sorry if I got it wrong, but he had some interest in chess, and then somehow they wanted to do some kind of event. It was important for them that Magnus was there, so they spoke with Magnus what would be interesting, and so on and so forth. And they built this thing, uh, this chess event. And well, it was held at this massive spa resort uh, near to the the Baltic Sea in, in Germany, Kiel being sort of the major city nearby. It was basically like you know when we went for. For, for let's say lunch, we would go to the castle and eat. If you went for dinner, you know we would go several places. And for breakfast, it was like the, the sort of the old farming house and such. So it was um, it was pretty pretty cool in in, in many ways. Um, but um, it was generally very awesome uh, conditions, I, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it looked like a very impressive event from the outside obviously there's the there's the usual kind of technical hiccups in the first couple of days with live broadcasts and things but it looked like a very professionally run event and it seemed like a good addition to the chess calendar and mm -hmm. the... that that was the idea i mean that's what at least what he said at the closing ceremony that he said i want to have this against the, uh, this event uh, against next year but I would generally like to have it a tour. So that was like, I think he mentioned uh, on five continents and so on and so forth. I'm not sure that he just said, you know, I will pay for everything like I, I did here. I think in general, their idea was to try and make it sustainable. So, I mean, I well, they had this concept at, at dinners in the evening that they actually wanted uh, people to talk together and to talk with the different people. I generally don't like that. Uh, I would rather sit for myself. But they were basically forcing social interactions on, on, on chess players. Oof, of course, was an it's very dangerous. I, I no, I, it feels uncomfortable. But uh, that meant I was talking one of the you know um, I think the perhaps the the, the father of uh, of of the sort of uh, the wife of of the sponsor, and he was talking about that. Um, well, in his company, that I was somewhat connected. 
they are sponsoring yachting, uh, and their you know big car company, I think it was BMW, would sponsor certain things and such. And they basically want to build long-term sustainable sponsorship. So the idea is not to be, let's say, a Messina in terms of, uh, let's say, Sinkfield, who just wants to, who happily pays for the same event again and again because he can afford it. They more hope that to build something that would be sustainable. So they actually cared tremendously about numbers. And uh, they kept kept mentioning, I mean, three-digit million numbers of of something that I was not completely sure uh, what was. And uh, as you mentioned, the technical part perhaps didn't work too well in the beginning. And that, of course, is crucial. That if you want to popularize it, you'd also have to work. And I think even some of the chess servers, the software was not capable of transmitting the games uh, probably in the beginning. But that got much better, I think. And I think generally they managed to make it very viewable and, and quite exciting. Or maybe I'm just too, too biased of it, of really wanting it to work. I thought it was a cool event in many ways. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely very watchable. I think the... Yeah, I mean, it, I guess with chess events, we're kind of used to the first day or two being kind of... Yeah. There's always something seems to go wrong. And I think it's pretty standard for us. Yeah, I mean, I guess... I'm not sure how watchable Fisher Random is to a kind of non-chess audience or a very amateur chess audience because I think it, it does add an extra layer of complexity sure. where they don't actually know how the pieces are set up at the start and that can maybe make it a, a, an already difficult game to understand makes it slightly more difficult but i don't think that part is a massive barrier i think if someone's kind of interested in chess they can get past that step quicker than you know actually learning to play chess that, I mean, that's much more difficult if a million norwegian can watch uh, chess on television I assume they can't understand. Uh, half of them can't understand how how the game is actually run, right? I mean, there has to be someone explaining that the narrative and this is exciting and that is exciting. Or you think actually, in normal Norwegian spectators can understand what happens at all? I guess. I mean, they definitely have to rely on the commentators a mm-hmm. lot. Uh, but I think um, if you watch kind of Twitch audiences, they can pick up on things pretty quickly. Maybe. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people can play chess at a pretty basic level. Um, if you look at kind of the numbers of people, you know, chess.com is whatever, 100 million members or something at this point. Um, I would guess the vast majority of them can play at, at least a kind of basic level. You know, some of those people will just make an account and then try and learn the moves and maybe they don't get them. Um, but I think most of those people will have a kind of, at least they'll know how the pieces move and they'll maybe have some very basic understanding of strategy, so I think they could probably follow along. Probably you're right. And chess nine six. Yeah, they, you need you do need good commentators for this. That's very important. I think for well, I mean for everyone, <laughs> we all yeah. want an entertaining. I mean, also the players took it seriously. It was quite clear that uh, I think they all cared. Uh, Aronian was extremely happy. He he was third in the end, but uh, he really enjoyed. It. Also, I mean, it sounds strange, but. Ronan has fallen a bit out of the world elite, right? We've all been used to that he's, uh, he was there for all the time. But uh, this time, perhaps uh, a little less. And he managed to actually be third and even beat uh, up to Satsarov in, in the fight for, for bronze uh, medal. But my feeling was everyone cared and took it very seriously. The only exception, I don't know if it's too sad, I think, to talk about almost, was, was Ding. I mean, Oof. Are, are we going to leave him alone? People, people yell at me too much for being mean about Ding. But it's also, I mean, I think we even spoke a bit about it someplace down there. I mean, well, he's the world champion. It is a story that he's doing very badly, right? We do have to address. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that if Magnus was doing this poorly, then people wouldn't be able to shut up about it. And the same with, uh, you know, previous world champions. Yeah. Like, he is the world champion and it is a story. It's a big story when he he doesn't do well. And I think, I do think there's a little bit of, patronizing that goes on around Ding where people, I genuinely think there's quite a lot of people that don't realize that he is actually the world champion and like he, sh- he we don't need to treat him like a baby. I understand that he has had some health problems like for sure and he's spoken that you know, at some point during the match even he said that you know, he felt like his mind wasn't working but he did, in his most recent interview he said that he was back 
you know, so, covered before YKNZ. Okay, he didn't play well in YKNZ, but that's just form to me. Like, I genuinely just don't think he's in great form. That's how I see it a bit. I remember, for instance, politicians in Denmark, if they take sick leave and they are away for half a year, we basically decide not to touch them. But if they announce they're back, I mean, you cannot be back half speed. If you, you know, go back into the ring, well, we will treat you like you're ready, right? I mean, that's how it should be in a way. Uh, and um... Yeah, and I, I do think that, that part of it as well is that Ding isn't, like, he is the world champion, but he at no point has he been leaps and bounds ahead of the other top players. Whereas, no. you know, at certain points, Magnus on a bad day was still probably world number one. <laughs> like, this... This is definitely when he's like 60, 70 points ahead of everyone else, you know, on a on a rough day, he was just still better than everyone. And Ding isn't that far ahead of everyone else, even if you would regard him as world number two, which he currently isn't. So for him, a bad day is, yeah, it does drop him below several people. And also, I mean, it was just 960. I think he's never basically played it before, right? I think oh, he scored horribly. Maybe he... I mean, how many games did he play? He played around 13 games. Maybe he made three draws or something like this. And uh, two of them perhaps was the draw would click. Yeah, but I, the I, match. I, I mean, okay, the, the round robin, he was, was a disaster. Like he uh-huh. lost six in a row and then drew the last one. But with the knockout part, okay, you like, if you lose the first one, there's always a much higher chance that you'll lose the second one. So I don't, I think the score is maybe a little bit harsher than it needs to be when you're taking the, the knockout part. But yeah, he's obviously very much out of form. He is going to play again next month in Granka. So we'll... We, we, you should be aware of that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> I will be aware in time, hopefully. We will see. Uh, so so that, that's true. Uh, yeah, but also yeah. like his, his main focus, I guess, should just be the next World Championship match. That would be normal, and I think that's sort of the disease I think we remember from uh, Kramnik and Arnand at that uh, they would peak at World Championship matches, they would keep their title, perhaps. But uh, I'm not sure Kramnik kept it that much, but he did. But they would not necessarily or not at all dominate in, in tournaments. And it becomes very rational that, of course, if you're the best player, like Magnus and Gary, you can do both. But if you are the world champion, but not necessarily the best player, the clearly best player, why wouldn't you focus on that? And history, will, of course, will remember him based on uh, you know what happens in well, what happened in the previous match. Will always be remembered for. But let's say should he win uh, the next match, well, that's what would would count, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Like if he wins the next match, it just completely overshadows everything. Like, he could lose every tournament. No one... Exactly. No, no. I'm... Yeah. But, oh, no. And yeah, I, I definitely agree, because I think I think maybe Kramnik in particular, I don't think he seemed to enjoy chess as much. Like, I think if you look at the way he played chess after he lost the title, uh-huh. he definitely seemed like he was having a lot more fun. Yeah, yeah. But... So, it's a, I guess it's a heavy weight to, to carry. I'm not sure if Ding... That's how Ding feels about it. But, yeah, I mean, the focus on keeping the title... Makes a lot of sense. No, no, give it just giving it away is uh, just a, it's the smart play, right? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, if it depends. Gonna... I mean, I think the money for winning. Yeah, exactly. If you can afford it, uh, yeah, oh. that, that that's probably a a reasonable disclaimer here. You mentioned Kramnik. Should we just switch to him? And first of all, we wish him a, a speedy recovery. Right? I think he's better by now. No, I'm not, I'm not really sure. He's definitely tweeting again, which okay. is a good sign. Is it? Uh, yeah, he did did have COVID and he seemed to end up in hospital. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I hope he feels better. I mean, I... Just, I mean, gave some kind of idea that, well, you know, it was more serious than uh, not in a way. I mean, not very serious, but he was hospitalized. We saw him lying in his hotel bed with uh, a drop in his arm. And, uh, I mean, you and him were talking nicely to each other, at least for, for a few hours. So there was a lot of uh, uncommon. Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't have any ill will towards Kramnik. No. I don't think he's a... Like, I, I disagree with him about yeah, the yeah. scale of cheating, but again, we're only disagreeing about the scale. We're not even disagreeing about the actual problem itself, so I have no... I mean, there are definitely people in the chess world that I I do wish ill upon, <laughs> but, but Kramnik is not one. We're going to have an episode about that, but yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I hope he recovers as well. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. think having these kind of online arguments is fun for me, and I 
Yeah, I hope he, I hope he gets back. It's like my help. feeling is that you are having fun from him, while for him, it's actually depth felt, right? I mean, uh, he means what he's writing. He's not just, you know, he's a, it's not like he thinks it's also entertaining. He actually, he passionately feels for what he's tweeting. Yeah, but the the problem is he's wrong. So, <laughs> so yeah, for that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about to I say mean, I, I can have fun with things because I'm correct. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> go on. Yeah, I mean he's he's back at the at his favorite topic, which is good. So, you know, I mean he's if he's not been so well, that's that's a shame. But he's he's got something to keep him busy, and the thing that's keeping him busy is accusing. Was it Martinez Alcantara of cheating? Exactly. It was not like he got into, well, what we call a shitstorm, but he sort of uh, got a lot of people to say, okay, Vladdy, now you're just completely wrong with this, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, we've <laughs> it's definitely covered extensively. So what happened this week is that uh, Chess.com were filming some content uh, with Jose Martinez, uh, Jospem, as he's known on Chess.com. And during, you know, I, I I don't know what the exactly they were filming. I guess it's some kind of stuff for the Champions Chess Tour interview, stuff like that. And while they were there, he played in Title Tuesday and he came second. Which, when you say it, it doesn't sound that impressive. It's, you know, it's just an online tournament. He came second. It's like, big deal. but like finishing second in Title Tuesday is actually not an easy thing to do. No. Um, it takes. A pretty impressive performance. I mean, it can be weak or stronger, but generally there's a bunch of very good players there, right? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I think in general... I, I didn't actually check who was playing that day, but, you know... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hikaru, Magnus, Fabi... Kramnik sometimes plays, sometimes doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Also, what you're say, like, I guess a dozen 2,700-plus players will be there, minimum. So, Along with maybe some... But Kramnik, I mean... Special. He, I mean... Well, you know, he, he didn't let you off the hook that easily. I think he was basically saying that, well, sure, he was second, but he was incredibly lucky. And then he managed to, well, I wouldn't say, well, he provided what he thought was proof uh, of that thesis. If it was proof, it's a different story. Yeah. But that was basically what he said, right? He thought that... Yeah, I mean, his his argument is that that Jose Matias didn't play as accurately as he did, but I think it's, it's an incredible piece of luck to... To finish second in that tournament while the Chess.com people are there, because realistically, if Chess.com came to film you, you know, playing in title Tuesday, the chances of you finishing second as a he got really lucky six hundred player. Yeah. You know, if if Jose Martinez is just a regular twenty six hundred player, which is what Kramnik is arguing, the chances that he this is the one day that he performs at a, such a high level is very very low. Oh, so, I mean, then his his nervous system is extremely impressive if he's capable of, uh, you know, saying, okay, stuff it. I'm just going to do it on my own today. And then, yeah, I managed. I mean, that is impressive. Uh, yeah, it it does seem very unlikely. I, I mean, I think he's just... Uh, a From good, a chess perspective, I mean, the positions Kramnik show, he was lucky, uh, no doubt about that. But, uh, I mean, as far as I remember, no, maybe not all of them, but there was some log involved. It's also hard not to be, and you have to be skillful to to get there. I think. Yeah, but I mean that this is always the argument with the smart cheaters. This is yeah. you know they get lost positions and they use the engine to figure their round. Mm-hmm. And like some people are just really good at playing in bad positions. Like yeah, 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 I think Magnus is actually pretty well, decent yeah. at this I mean, as well. <laughs> I'm arguing that Magnus is so good at it because he has a tremendous training in playing these crappy positions, and it's almost. Just a joke, but actually not fully. I mean, you know, it helps. I mean, you know, yeah. I've seen, seen I've, I've seen this quote recently a couple of times about. I think it might have been Nate Solon, but I'm not totally sure if it was him that invented this. But it was about chess. Chess training is, you know, training fencing, whereas playing a chess game is like a knife fight. And I kind of get that analogy, but especially when it comes to online blitz, it does definitely feel a lot more like a knife fight than anything else, where, especially if you're if you're watching top players with you know, they're playing the game and you're following with the engine, and you see the engine bar swing back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, these guys don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> they're just... No. No, but that's, I mean... Well, I mean, you can see Hikaru and Magnus, they can play all kind of uh, crap, 
and because they understand that's not how a game is decided, right? So I think the, the good players has a has a feeling for that. While Kramnik will probably take his time and he will try to play good moves, and then he will think that he got uh, he got unlucky, which is uh, perhaps not uh, the truth at all. But that that in itself is kind of an interesting thing to say because I don't think very many strong players see themselves as unlucky when it comes to over the board chess. That would be a very unusual yeah. thing for a, I think a grandmaster to say. I, I you hear it very. I mean, it's yeah. It's I mean, someone arguing that I was you know unlucky in this tournament. I have not really heard this uh, excuse being used at all. I mean, I mean, sometimes there's like very strange resources, you know, that maybe just appears out of nowhere. But it, I think it's very unusual to say to refer to bad luck. Good luck happens quite often. Oh yeah. But bad luck is... No, that's... I mean, it's a famous Larson quote. He says there is no bad luck in chess, but there is quite some good luck, if I remember. Oh, I forgot it was the reverse. I I think that was the point, yeah. Sorry, that's a bit embarrassing. Uh, On the subject of Kramnik, my impression is that he tweets a lot. (laughs) His his volume is bigger than mine, for instance, right? Quite possibly. He he does go on some binges of, of replying to... Anyone and everyone, I think, at some uh-huh. point. He definitely enjoys social media. Um, well, but yeah, it's it's interesting the way he he deals with criticism because he he definitely deals with criticism in a genuine way. Like I, don't, but he he's also I don't like the way he pretends that he's not accusing people. I think that's a little. <laughs> no, bit. I mean it's nice if you can have your cake and eat it. Uh, I hope he can't sue me for saying that, but it's, I mean, well, it's basically like you can accuse someone of being suspicious, and that's like, but that's not an accusation. You're saying that this is extremely <laughs> suspicious, right? I mean, it's like, no, if I started saying that the certain FIDE employee's account, a bank account seems to grow irregularly, but I'm not as accusing of corruption. I have no knowledge of that, so it's not a real accusation, but I mean, it's like you can't say it and not say it at the same time. I, I, I guess, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's easier to argue when when people yeah. are clear about what they actually but, believe. But <laughs> what I like a bit is sort of, I mean, that uh, well, you, you and him has quite some insight. He must also think that, uh, I mean, unless he completely doesn't read my Twitter, that I have some beef with him about the previous uh, where he has gotten money from and so forth. But he doesn't seem to take it personal, right? I mean. When you wish him get well soon, he considers it as completely genuine, right? It's not like he thinks that you are sarcastic or anything like that, right? I mean, you uh, you disagree, and you disagree with an enormous passion, but there's still some kind of uh, friendliness there. I- I'm getting. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's a healthy way to to live. I mean, like I think it's basically... okay to disagree with people and disagree with them quite. It's seriously. not far, Yeah, but also disagreeing is not far from you calling him an idiot or something like that, right? Or am I getting it wrong? <laughs> I mean, I think he's definitely called me an idiot at some part. Or he yeah, might. Have, I think he referred to me as low IQ. <laughs> wow, okay. that is actually disrespectful. But... Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I some of the things he says are just uh, nuts. Like for example, he he talks about Jose Martinez and Nakamura play. A, have played a lot of people who have been banned for cheating. This was one of his recent things. And so then he shows the, all these accounts that they played, and all these guys have been banned. And all of these guys are untitled players because Hikaru and Jospem they play again. They play in like random arenas. They stream. They play against a bunch of anonymous people, and yeah, they'll some of those people will be cheaters. Mm-hmm. Kramnik doesn't play against those cheaters because he only plays against titled players in titled Tuesdays. Like very, very few games against anonymous untitled players in mm-hmm. Kramnik's history. So of course he's not going to come across. It. No, but they're on the subject of low IQ. That I have to admit that I was certain of Kramnik's tweet that I'm just, I'm not capable of, of, of understanding. Maybe I'm not trying hard enough, but it generally, he loses me now and then. But, yeah, I mean, he, def- he definitely has some interest in, in people's IQ. But... <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. no. I, I think he also accused Gotham of being low IQ. And up but they. <laughs> no, but, I mean, you have to like him. He's not sort of thinking, okay, this is the biggest uh, account in the whole of chess maybe I should treat him nicely no no he just uh, okay oh that's no yeah that'd be nice fair I mean he's a world champion like yeah former world champion 
on the subject of uh, world champions or former world champions or becoming the world champion, there was a story I was a little bit surprised, got little attention. But at some point, Peter Dockers tweeted that, uh, okay, this, I mean, Nakamura interview, it, it seems to indicate that um, Fida was trying to get uh, Magnus back in the candidates' tournament, and they were considering changing the regulations. Uh, as people might know, I'm working for Magnus, so... I'm somewhat biased here and might or might not have inside knowledge, but I was a bit surprised no one really seemed to, to care much in the beginning. Isn't that a big story? Yeah, I mean, I guess, well, I mean, Emil Satovsky did just deny everything. <laughs> I guess we never really know the truth, but yeah, I think the quote was that at the last minute, uh, Fide had kind of offered the players to change the format so that it would be some I'm not even entirely sure what the the proposed format was, but it was one slow game and then two fast games. It's, so I don't really know what that means, but I assume it kind of is broadly the things that that Magnus is hinted about. Oh, that he like, wants more fast games. I mean, but they ask the players, but what they are asking in reality is sort of, uh, I'm sorry, guys, but would you mind changing the format? And then, by the way, you're getting Magnus instead of Abasov in the candidate tournament. <laughs> We don't think it's going to affect your equity massively, but is that cool? I mean, I, mean, it's, I, I, I have some sympathy with Fide because I think from a marketing point of view, it obviously makes a lot of sense to have Magnus in the candidates. Sure. And from a sporting point of view, it also has a lot of sense for Magnus to play for the world championship because he is the best chess player in the world. But I think the way they go around these things is kind of insane because I think from a sporting point of view, if you ask any of the candidates, would you like Magnus to play in the candidates? They'll just yeah. say, no, I, I would like to be world champion. Yeah, they would. I mean, if I was the players, I would say, I think that's a bad format change. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I don't really, I mean, I guess it's the kind of thing that they can't impose upon the players without, you know. They can. They can say, this isn't the f uh, interest of the sport. We are elected to... Uh... To, to sort of uh, care for. I, mean, I bet I think the players would simply refuse to play. Yeah, yeah. But also, like, I think if you ask them, they're just going to say, no, it's fine. Like, I mean, Caruana or yeah. Nakamura or Nepo are always just going to say immediately, no, this is my chance to become world champion. Yeah. yeah. They all think they have a very good chance against Ding. So, you know, they, <laughs> they don't want to. We are literally here. talking about that accepting Magnus in would be more than halving their chances, right? I mean, I assume. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it definitely takes that. And I, I'm, I'm not criticizing the players in no. any way here. This is absolutely the correct decision because there's no reason for them to to make concessions to let Magnus in. But I'm kind of curious. Is like, also, if they did make this change, they would have to change the match as well. Not necessarily. Well, because Magnus won't play the match. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you shot. That could be. I don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah. I... So are they... Because, again, they would have to get Ding to agree to, yeah, we're going to play the match as rapid chess. And Ding would say, no, I'm the world champion. I'll stick with my format. That he won it. Well, but I, I mean... Well, I'm... Yeah, I... I... I like to do ad advertisement of uh, free stuff I got. I got a book from Elgin Ruby uh, about court noise best years. And they're talking about the Cup of Korchnoi match in uh, 1978. But, but they played two, I think, six wins. But that was uh, a change made uh, to accommodate Fischer to some extent, right? Uh, so, I mean, you know, you do get rule change to accommodate someone else and then you just uh, end up with, right? I mean, uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess. I guess so, but it just... Yeah, I don't know. I I would be. I, I guess it depends on what the exact format was. I don't think rapid chess needs to play any real part in the classical cycle. I think faster classical. I don't think is necessarily a terrible idea. No, but that's. I mean, now I think. Well, this tournament day in Grenka, right? That's gonna be like two fast classical games a day or is it too very slow rapid I mean it's something like 45 minutes per player right and some kind of agreement maybe yeah I, I think I would prefer still a bit slower than that but yeah yeah I can I, I, think I would like to know what Magnus is. opinion is before I say what mine is because I have no clue uh, but, uh, yeah yeah yeah
No, no, I mean, I think two games a day actually does make things a lot more interesting though, because one one game can just end and it's a quick draw or whatever and like okay, there's no there's nothing to really watch here. I understand it's my career and how I earned my my money and had a career, but I mean, well, so much goes into preparation. If you actually split it that they have to play two games, uh, you know, you have to focus and prep in in both direction, and uh, it will become more difficult for pl- players to do absurd kind of memorization and such. So I genuinely like it, but of course it will be a huge breach with our our sort of uh, traditions. So, I mean... And strangely, while I talk about, you know, chess has become boring, it all depends on preparations. My honest prediction for the candidates is, is it's going to be fireworks. Uh, I don't think everything is going to be just blocked at all there. P- partly depending on the due to the players. I mean, if you add uh, Giri and So, it would have been uh, more boring, but Somehow with this bunch of players, I think it's going to be very competitive and interesting. Yeah, I can't see this field providing a very boring event. It's, it feels impossible, right? I mean, just... Well, chess might, you know, be dull, but uh, these guys will just, uh, I mean, overpower it. Yeah, d- definitely. I think this will be an exciting candidate. And also, I was expecting uh, to announce that Prague is the new Indian number one during this episode, but he has actually lost his game. Well, he was doing pretty well, and is he then down to top, out of top five, or how does it work in India these days? Uh, I think he's still number five. Still number five, I guess. Okay. No, I think it's a serious swing there. Yeah, he has to. Yeah, he would have to drop below Nihal, I guess. Uh huh. What okay. happened to Nihal? He's still only nineteen. No, I mean, I've worked for an Indian player for plus 10 years, but it was really not necessary to check the rating lists at that point. So, uh, I'm not into this kind of habits. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the candidates thing. I, I, I don't know what what the the whole story was there. It seems very odd that they would, they would do it in this way, but also, yeah, the kind of... It's the kind of thing I do expect from Fides. Yeah, yeah. On that subject, on the candidates, there is some kind of controversy that people are talking about, but perhaps not writing about. But with, uh, I mean, some of the players has been mentioning that if they have to display their own sponsor, they have to give Fides some kind of mm. something back in terms of maybe not payment, but uh, services, right? That they have to appear for, I don't know, lessons, media appearances or so, something like that, right? I, I guess we should reveal our sources if we have any, but uh, work with some talk about that if I understand it correctly, right? Yeah, I think this has been an ongoing thing. I think this may be the first time this popped up was the the last FIDE Grand Prix, mm-hmm. um, where the there was some public complaints about, you know, they were insisting that they got a cut of players' private sponsorship or had to do some tasks or some... Just for basic understanding, how unreasonable is it that the organizer says that if you want to display your personal sponsors at our event, you either need a cut or you need to do something in return for us? Is that complete? I mean, it can't be completely unheard of. I mean, I guess that the FIFA World I think it's entirely reasonable for a private organizer. Mm-hmm. But I think for the governing, board, uh, governing body of the sport, I don't think this is something that is done in other sports. Like I, I find it hard to believe that footballers are paying, you know, a percentage of their Nike sponsorship to FIFA. They might be bound if you play for the national team, you have to play the national team sponsor. But that's somewhat uh, different. And I, I don't think that's even the case, right? This, I honestly don't. I mean, know. Like, you know, Ronaldo is not changing his shoes. Messi is not changing his shoes. Probably, it's, maybe. I mean, what you are saying is. Well, let's be honest. It's just a power struggle, right? I mean, you know, I mean, if you can't force Messi to do it, then that's it. And uh, you want Messi to play, right? I mean, here maybe... Unfortunately, we have a Messi in our sport. And, you know, I don't think Magnus has been bullied out of not showing his sponsorship because he usually has several. And I'm I'm curious how that is dealt with by Fide because it... I, I genuinely don't know if Magnus just ignores them and just says, okay, like, if you don't let me do this, I won't play, or if he is being fine and he just takes the hit, or if he's like, no, you can have a cut of my sponsorship money, which seems also very unlikely. That that would be more surprising if you, if you said that. Uh, here is 20% of my, my recent sponsor uh, sponsored deals. Um, 
or also be unreasonable. But I mean, of course, there can be conflicts. If uh, FIDE has a huge deal with uh, Pepsi Cola, it can't be that Magnus plays with a Coca Cola sweat, right? Definitely, that should be the exception. But yeah, at the moment, FIDE don't really have any sponsor. <laughs> no, no, would clash with the uh, most players' sponsors. I mean, I don't yeah. think. Uh, I don't think many players are sponsored by the big rival to Russian Railways or to Fosagro or... No, I honestly don't know. I mean, Gazprom, what is the... I don't know who Gazprom's main rival is, to be honest. So, No, I, I, I get that point. I think also what FIDE is asking for is some kind of... Uh, well, you have to do 10 hours of, of something. But, um, well, that can either be quite nice. I mean, okay, 10 hours, so... You do it in one evening, you get it over with. But if you sort of, if FIDE can split it into 20 half hour segments, it becomes kind of annoying. I think recently we saw some advertising for the FIDE web shop, right? And we saw many of the players posing in the new FIDE collection. That strikes me as something that uh, these guys are moderately forced to do, not because they think, wow, this is a nice collection. Let me just advertise it for free. Yeah, it's. I mean, I, I really don't know what the deal... I mean, it was Vidit and Caruana that were... Probably, yeah. The models, and... Yeah, I mean, maybe they were just paid to do this. Maybe they're just huge fashion fans of uh, FIDE March. But it, it, it does seem like a, a kind of strange thing to get the players to do. And, yeah, I mean, there's been... There has been talk that, you know, you have to... If you want to show your sponsor, you have to do so many hours of work. But also, I mean, if FIDE are actually forcing the players to promise these hours, at least have something quite useful to do with these hours, right? I mean, else it becomes basically we're forcing you to do something and we have no clue what we're going to actually do when we get it, right? Yeah, but it does feel like the it creates some bad will with the players. And I think you... I mean, obviously, a lot of the top players are quite expensive to hire for events, but they're not that expensive. When you consider the, you know, the... The prize fund in these events, you know, you could probably just pay them a little bit extra money if you want them to do an event, put on a good event. They'll be in, they'll be motivated to do it because they're being paid to do it, and rather than kind of backs into a corner. And I think the difference of a player wanting to do something, where <laughs> compared to when they don't want to do something, is quite big. So, you know, you no, know, you can do it if you can see a player is doing an interview, for example, and they're, you know, they want to do an interview. The interviews are usually pretty good. Um, but when they don't want to do an interview, the interviews are really bad. So, it does... Think of, often, thinking of Magnus. Right? Well, not exclusively, yeah. perhaps. The thing is with Magnus, when he doesn't want to do an interview, they're usually the best ones. Because <laughs> maybe, maybe. maybe. He's, they're short, you can get a very nice clip. And yeah. then, yeah, sometimes it goes viral. So. No, fair, fair enough. So... So yeah, that's more or less on my all on my list, unless we want to talk about uh, kayaking. But maybe we generally don't want to talk about kayaking. That's right. I mean, I well, talk about- I, one thing I'm curious about. I mean, we this is the free day podcast, and probably we haven't really talked about free day or Russia very much. But I'm kind of curious: has anyone just made a, a complaint to the ethics commission about what he's doing because he is? Very much doing worse things than he was doing for his by, by a by a large degree, but I think no one has put uh, a complaint to the FIDE Ethics Committee about kayaking. I know the German Chess Federation was intending to do it, and they wrote to a lot of European countries asking them to join, but uh, mm. very few replied. Even fewer said they would do would join, so they seem to have given up on that. But this idea you are saying that everybody can just file a complaint, that is not clear, legally speaking. I mean, you have to have this kind of what's called legal standing. And, uh, I mean, well, by by rules, it's FIDE who has to protect the image of FIDE and the image of a sport. That's the, I mean, the FIDE council can do it. The FIDE president can, can, can do it. Maybe also the FIDE management board. But if anyone else can do it, it's somewhat unclear. I mean, well, you can, um, I mean, if someone has offended you personally, you can file a complaint. But to file a complaint, I mean, I don't think I could file a complaint. I say, Mr. Dodgy is, you know, creating disrespect to the game of chess. I mean, well, it has to be, well, I mean, 
there has to be some kind of angle there, I think, or it has to be extremely grave. And I think that could be the argument that Kayakins is so bad that it affects every chess player in the world and we could do something like that. But uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, no. I guess it, it definitely doesn't affect every chess player, but it does seem to me like there has been a precedent set at least with this previous behavior. And I mean, to I'm, be honest, I'm a little bit unsure why they don't do it because kayaking is a lost cause for them anyway. And banning kayaking could be a pretty good PR victory uh, for them in a way and something that costs them very little. The only reason I could come up with that uh, it would be uncomfortable for Dvorkovic uh, and that uh, would create some tension in Russia that would not be good for him. At the smallest, I mean, why, why would they not uh, ban him? It would be great for Fide. They punch Kayakin as hard as they can, and Kayakin can do his stuff in, in Russia anyway. Yeah, and I, he definitely is still playing. His tournaments are FIDE rated as well, so he's definitely are, are still they, within... Are they FIDE rated? They are FIDE rated, yeah. I you checked... The rapid ones? Yes. Wow. Wow, that's so, embarrassing that you know more about this than me. <laughs> so he is still playing FIDE rated games, which means he's well within their jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, he played also some have some league where he played a game or two, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, but I, I I checked the the rapid. It was rapid in blitz games. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I have blitz seen blitz I should drop to like twenty six forty, which I found quite surprised as well. Because I mean, traditionally, has he's always been a very strong blitz. But I think he's is he a former world champion in blitz? Yeah, for sure. Uh he is in blitz or rapid for sure. I mean, he's referred to himself as. As a world champion, so that's... Uh... Yeah, I'm pretty sure at least in play. Maybe both, actually. I think he might be the only one that's won both, other than Magnus. That could be. Um... But yeah. Also, speaking of people who <laughs> potentially be banned, I do actually think the Kramnik could suffer from an ethics commission thing at some point, because it... also he has been playing feeder raid games. So... Mm-hmm. He's still within Fide's jurisdiction, and they've banned people for making unfair accusations in the past. They didn't ban Magnus, but <laughs> it no, but they find him. Uh, they find him for not uh, for for withdrawing from a tournament, right? Yeah, which was strange. Uh, I don't... <laughs> yeah, well, they yeah. Anyway, yeah, let's not uh, go there. But that is true. I mean, but no, you were saying that. But who could do it? I mean, you suppose. Well, I mean, that, who could who could r- report Kramnik? I, mean, I can give you a list of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah then I have any different people. Now. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of individuals who can do it. There is probably Chess.com could do it in general, and I assume Fida could also do it, right? For sure. I mean, so. Yeah, I mean, probably. I don't think Kram. I don't think uh, Hikaru could do it because I think Hikaru is benefits too much from. Kramnik's accusations. <laughs> maybe, maybe in, in a... I, I do have I do have some sympathy for Jose Martinez. It does seem to be from his tweets at least, he does seem to be affected by it. It's... I mean, during this uh, I forgot what the online tournament was called. I was actually Nepam who was making uh some kind of I don't know, accusations was maybe too strong, but he was uh I forgot the English word for it. Yeah, it was insin- insinuating, right? Insinuating I mean, quite heavily. I mean, when you say nothing you can do and a smiley after having lust, I mean, it's not as at Kramnik level, perhaps, but it's still, uh, it's hard to understand it in any other way, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, he definitely knows what he's doing, but yeah, he's yeah. a little bit more subtle about it. And... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, so was Magnus. Like, Magnus knew what he was doing when he said... When he posted the Jose Mourinho thing, so so, so you claim, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was just an entirely random clip, and so oh, yeah. it was uh... <laughs> no, okay. I mean, yeah, fair enough. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I kind of, I, I mean, I think okay, you can. There's a line somewhere. I don't know where the line should be, but I think I would be very surprised uh, knowing that they have. You know, banned people for accusations before that Kramnik. I'd be very surprised if Kramnik hasn't crossed that line already. And I think that, you know, nobody really wants to do anything because officially he's retired. He doesn't really play yeah. classical anymore. They still play a feeder. No, but also, I mean, 
I understand you might not believe me, but at sometimes I'm holding back with critique on Twitter, especially let's say towards people. In, I mean, I have no evidence of people getting paid uh, in feed for certain things and so on, because I don't have evidence for that. I really assume I cannot just start of uh, throwing out uh, wild rumors uh, or things I, I believe without having any kind of back, right? I thought that's how legal things work, but about this cheating thing, I mean, I will always say the problem is if you go after somebody, someone will say, okay, what about the 10 others who said similar, right? I mean, isn't that where we are? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, if you go back far enough, you know, Hikaru is maybe, was at some point probably the worst one for accusing people of cheating. Oh, like, maybe, yeah, I don't know. And definitely, you know, there's there's been other people. I think, in general, streamers tend to be pretty reckless for this kind of behavior because they're live and, you know, they, you know the mouth just speaks without connecting with the yeah, brain. Yeah, yeah. So there's some, some leeway there. But I guess, you know, at some point someone has to... But from a feeder ethics committee perspective, it doesn't matter if, if 20 people have done it. No one, I mean, you know, one could do a case and we will get a verdict uh, on it, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we definitely are trying to find more work for the feed ethics committee. Yeah, yeah, uh, but oh, we still haven't found it. We still haven't uh, given them a new job. Ah, oh, speak for yourself. Uh, there, I think. Uh, I mean, no, I, I almost feel embarrassed with the, how many pages the feed ethics committee has to to read due to 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 me and and those I'm filing a protest together with. But um, unfortunately, the the feed ethics rules are that um, during a case, you're not allowed to talk about any specifics so it's a feeder rule i'll try and follow we have an ongoing case let's see how it if it ever ever gets a verdict but uh, that's a bit different yeah i mean i guess they're they're pretty slow is my impression but i, I from the cases i've read they seem to be reasonably fair so i mean i i haven't I, lost any respect for to them. say that they are slow is i don't know i mean first the kayaking case in 2022 they did rather quickly and um for instance, their appeal of Kayakin, they also did rather quickly, and they answered very thoroughly, in, in my opinion. If anything, I was surprised but that we are talking about people who is doing this for free after work hours. I mean, that was a they, But they were, there was a time, like, there was a time-sensitive element to that because they, the candidates was coming up. I understand, but from a feed ethics committee point of view, they could say, and so what? I mean... Uh, well, it's not our problem. I mean, we have a legal system, and that's uh, how it is. Yeah, but I, I guess the the problem would be that it would bring chess further into disrepute by having him play in yeah, the yeah. So Maybe you're right. It would create further just, damage. So there was. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if that's what the actual. Act what I'm trying to say is that with appeals committee, I think Loang really hit the jackpot. Being on the feed ethics committee, that could be quite some work, actually, if you want to do it properly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've definitely I've read some of the cases, and there, yeah, that does seem a lot more work than I mean, I've seen some of the appeals decisions, especially yeah. the World Rapper recently, where you just you know you look at someone's shoes and say, okay, those are completely unacceptable. And that's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's I mean, as a tournament dictator, you would basically just say yes or no based on how you feel, right? I mean, this yeah, kind of much. yeah, yeah. But, depends uh, on your mood, depends on your fashion sense for some inexplicable reason. <laughs> no, I mean, well, the ethics committee will actually refer to not only earlier cases within the the, the feeder ethics systems, but in general sports law. I mean, they have read. Uh, I mean, they're skilled lawyers. They have read law books. They have read previous cases in other sports and so on and so forth. I mean, an appeals committee decision will just be, you know, well, with a bit of luck, they might refer to some something in the rule book, right? But uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I believe. Uh, at some point, someone googled the definition of sneakers and posted yeah. the Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, so yeah, yeah. So I guess I guess that's everything on our list for this. I'm week. afraid so. Any... Anything up? Not really. No. I'm. I'm. I'm so. That was our tenth episode. I don't know if that means goodbye or we're gonna go on and such. We'll see. I guess. Yeah. Well, maybe okay. we'll do ten more. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, if, should feed uh, create content, we might. Who knows? Yeah. They they seem pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. But yeah, we'll see, and maybe we'll do 
we'll have some kind of candidate specials. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. They're good. I, I think, I, I don't know how we can drag Jan and Laurent back in. We might have to trick them at some point. You can maybe tell them I'm not going to be there, but I don't know. Or, <laughs> yeah. I don't. No, I don't know. Well, we can just, uh, we should just ask, right? So, yeah. Yeah, we could ask. I mean, I think Laurent's in an excellent mood at the moment. His his dreams have finally come true, I think. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm jealous and always a bit surprised. That, yeah. oh, you know, Laurent always get there in the end somehow. Yeah. We have to respect that ability. Yep. Okay. Well, okay, thanks for listening, care. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> See you next week. Bye. Bye.